So anyway, let's begin. The hour is coming and is now when the time when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him. Let us kneel in our hearts in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts, confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are the, his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Four. Do it again. Psalm 114. Alleluia. When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange speech, Judah became God's sanctuary and Israel his dominion. The sea beheld it and fled. Jordan turned and went back. The mountains skipped like rams and the little hills like young sheep. What ailed you, O sea, and that you fled? O Jordan, that you have turned back. You mountains that you skipped like rams, you little hills like young sheep. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the hard rock into a pool of water and flint stone into a flowing spring. Glory. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lessons.
With God's blessing and protection, the Hebrew people passed through the waters of the Red Sea to freedom and life. The Egyptians who pursue them are drowned. A reading from the book of Exodus. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and the chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, The Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the waters, forming, I beg your pardon here. Uh, Followed them into the sea. Yeah, here we go. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead people, feared the Lord, I'm sorry, on the seashore. Um, Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our canticle this morning is incorrect in the bulletin. Um, we will, Deb will be reading Canical uh, 8, and I want to remind you of something we talked about last week, that there is a part of this canticle, uh, the second, um, uh, the, really the second line, is the oldest existing scripture, or we have the original scripture for this. It is the oldest in the Bible. So take it away, Deb. Thank you. The Song of Moses. I will sing to the Lord, for he is lofty and uplifted. The horse and its rider has he hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my refuge. The Lord has become my savior. This is my God, and I will praise him. The God of my people, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a mighty warrior. Yahweh is his name. The chariots of Pharaoh and his army has he hurled into the sea. 
The finest of those who bear armor have been drowned in the Red Sea. The fathomless deep has overwhelmed them. They sank into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in might. Your right hand, O Lord, has overthrown the enemy. Who can be compared with you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, awesome in renown, and worker of wonders? You stretch forth your right hand, the earth swallowed them up. With your constant love, sorry, uh, You stretch forth your right hand, the earth swallowed them up. With your constant love, you led the people you redeemed. With, with your might, you brought them in safety to your holy dwelling. You'll bring them in and plant them on the mount of your possession. The resting place you have made for yourselves, O Lord. The sanctuary, O Lord, that your hand has established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The details of our religious practice are not as important as our self-giving love for one another, as God's redeemed people. The second reading from Romans, a reading from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike yet all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God freely offers gracious forgiveness. Oh, do you have another canticle? Sorry. Yeah. You're muted, Beth. Okay. Our second canticle this morning uh, is also incorrect in the bulletin. We're going to, Deb is going to read canticle 16 the Song of Zechariah. 
this should be familiar to those of you who grew up uh, doing morning prayer three times a month. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior, born in the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our, fa to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. God freely offers gracious forgiveness, but also expects each of us to likewise offer gracious forgiveness to each other. A reading from Matthew. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wishes to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, the Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused then and went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. When his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you now not have that mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And the anger in his Lord handed him over to the tortured, to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So the heavenly father will also do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, God is harsh in our first reading, our first lesson, and, and in the gospel reading as well. Um, and I, can't, I, th I think that, you know, this, this story of the parting of the Red Sea, um, people want to clean that up, you know, and uh, especially if you're trying to teach something in Sunday school, you want to kind of make it sound like maybe the Egyptians floated to the surface and swam away with their horses and uh, what have you. And it always brings back memories of 
for me of camp when I my first job, you know, was as a um, um, counselor, uh, a chaplain at a camp and conference center. And I thought I was going to get to lead retreats all the time. And turns out I had to do camp in the summertime with the kids. And so for chapel every Sunday, we acted out the lessons. And I had my dog, Bo, with me, and he was the camp dog. And he played many roles in the acting out of scripture. And one of the things he played was Pharaoh's horse pulling the chariot and getting drowned in the Red Sea. And he played it beautifully, if you ask me, um, although he um, tended to get a lot of giggles and laughs and carried on, but he made a very good horse. Anyway, so we have this story and it's ancient. I talked about it last week. Uh, it, is, it is just the foundation, this and our Old Testament reading last week of the Passover are found absolutely foundational to our faith. And the, the story is about the salvation of God's people. So we were asked to pull our eyes away from this terrible act that happened in the middle of the Red Sea where all the Egyptians got drowned and look at the salvation of this tribe of the Hebrew nation. And I, I, you know, this little bit of scripture is really Miriam's song. Miriam was um, um, Moses' sister, the one who put him in the basket and floated him on the Nile in the bulrushes so he could be found and not killed as most of the Hebrew babies were being killed. So anyway, this is just absolutely foundational. And then we go through... Um, the story of Jesus giving this parable and talking to Peter. And it, of course, the results of, of the parable are, you know, if you can't find forgiveness in your heart and mercy, well, off to the depths you go, you know, where the, we know there's gnashing of teeth and all kinds of carrying on. So I ask you to take this gospel seriously not the part that says you'll be cast into the depths um it, i mean i don't think it says that exactly but you you catch my drift i'm sure um and so what is this saying to us and what are we to take seriously and uh, before we can even begin to talk about our own forgiveness of 70 times 70 of of the people who have harmed us or our desire to be forgiven, we have to look at what Jesus says as he marches to the cross on, during the Last Supper. And what he says is that he goes on the cross in order to have the forgiveness of sin. It doesn't say this in any of the other gospels. It is only in Matthew, but Jesus is saying to the disciples and to us that he is climbing upon the cross in order to achieve forgiveness of sins. Now that is heavy stuff. Jesus' death on the cross changed the universe didn't just change the world, it changed the cosmos and the universe itself. It flipped over this whole system of retributive uh, punishment and, um, and made it about ret retributive justice that no longer, for at least the believers in God, no longer was sin unforgivable. Things were changed, are changed, will be changed, will never be the same again for all eternity because Jesus took that step. And so I think that what we have to hold in our hearts is that's the foundation. And who is forgiven? Well, it's us. We are forgiven. We are given this gift 
of forgiveness. And it happened for us the minute Jesus climbed up on the cross. The mercy of that is beyond what I can comprehend. I don't know if it is for you or not, but it is so vast and so deep. When you think about the whole world and all the people that have gone forward in the world since Christ climbed upon the cross, that is an awful lot of forgiveness. So 70 times 70 seems like a, a minuscule little amount compared to the amount of forgiveness that God has thrown upon the world. And it goes, and I'm sure it time travels back from before Christ got on the cross. It has to be that way. I can't see how it could be any other way. If you, if you begin to know God deep enough and well enough, then you begin to know what God is like. And then you begin to get the idea that, you know, our God's not the kind of God that would say, okay, all you people that were around before Jesus climbed on the cross, you're out of luck. I don't think he acts that way. I don't think he can act that way. I think it is not his nature to be that way. And so that's what we hold on to specifically with this reading. I think we also have to look at, you know, it, I think this is a, an awful parable. Um, well, it's just harsh. Um, but um, I guess it kind of gets the point across that forgiveness is important. And boy, is it ever. Um, I think that we're, we're to look at this and look at what has been done for us and conjure up somehow or another from our depths the ability to forgive. That is one of the hardest darn things. And I don't know about you, but I have people in my life that I need to practice forgiveness with, and you probably do too. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so that's who we're talking about this morning. Man, I can remember uh, one of my first um, AA meetings, and I had a long list of folks that um, I probably needed to make amends to or forgive or let go of things. And um, I was sitting in a meeting and I didn't quite grasp just how many folks there were on the list or what that actually meant. And this old timer was talking about how he said, you know, if you could work uh, AA's amends steps, which has become willing to make amends to all persons we had harmed, except when to do so would injure them or others. Anyway, if you were willing to work this step perfectly, there wouldn't be a single solitary person in the whole world that you would be, feel funny about sitting down across the table from and talking to them. And I thought, oh, because I could immediately think of an awful lot of people that I wouldn't have been joyful about walking in the room and sitting down at the table uh, across from me. So the depth, and I, can, I thought, oh, well, they can't possibly mean this person or that person, because they don't know. They just don't know what this person or that person has done to me. Well, they were to tell me through the years, doesn't make any difference. Our job is not to fix, not to patch up, but is to simply look at those things that we have done wrong and make amends for those things. And in order to do that, I think you have to have a little measure of self-forgiveness, of knowing that you have been forgiven by God and that you can now begin to forgive yourself for your humanness and for your mistakes and for the things that you have done wrong and then reach out to those who have hurt you and offer forgiveness.
there used to be an expression that I heard all the time. I haven't heard it for a while, but it is when you go to bed at night, forgive everybody everything. Well, good luck if you can actually do that. I'm proud of you. <laughs> you know, it's not an easy thing. You have to um, work at that. And, and probably because we're not perfect, you will never get that perfectly. But at the same time, as soon as you become aware of something that needs forgiving in yourself, you need to remember this parable and this business of Jesus's conversation with Peter and, um, and learn to forgive yourself 70 times over and also be able to go to people whom you need to forgive and do the best you can to make um, things right. You know, if you're a reader of Richard Rohr, uh, you have, uh, been reading all week about all this past week about retributive justice and about justice and reading um, writers who are quite famous uh, uh, talk about um, forgiveness and about justice and so I would recommend that you go to Richard Rohr's website um, if you just google Richard Rohr I'm sure it would take you there and uh, go through and read um, the the uh, meditations for this past week, they're uh, kind of mind blowing really. And so is this gospel. This really flips the whole world. It just as the cross flipped everything, this particular gospel flips everything over on its ear. You know, the first shall be last and the last shall be first and you will, you know, get in line, end up at the end of the line. And you know, the, the, this is the Christian way of life. Well, forgiving everybody that's hurt you, oh, that's a lot harder almost than being the last, I think. Anyway, that's what we're asked to do when we do this. And the gift there, of course, there's a gift in everything. And so the gift in this is when we're able to do it, we find ourselves set free. And then we understand that the lack of forgiveness binds us to the person that we can't forgive in a way that puts us in prison. And when we are able to forgive, there's a great letting go. The doors of the prison swing open and we are set free. Now, I'm going to end with this terrible story. I've told it to you before, I know, but it is such a story, and it really describes what happens when we carry resentments toward people in our hearts and are not able to let go. It's a story I heard from Barbara Crafton, who um, is a giant in the Episcopal Church, and if you don't know of her, and I quote her a lot, so you probably figured her out. But anyway, she's, um, she's basically retired now. But she did a retreat one time on forgiveness. And I went. Um, and it was uh, amazing. But here's a story that she told about forgiveness. It's about a couple of elk that were fighting. And as they fought, their antlers got caught together and they could not get these antlers apart. And so one elk is left dragging the other elk for the rest of, the, of, the, of his life. The other elk died, of course. So not only is this elk dragging this other elk everywhere he goes, but the other elk is rotting because it's dead. And so what he is doing is dragging this rotting carcass everywhere he goes. Can't get rid of it, it follows him. That's what happens to us when we're unable to forgive, when we cannot let go of those things that just eat away at us. It's like dragging a rotting carcass along with you. You know, um, letting go 
Letting go is what this gospel is all about. God has let go of all of our sins. God knows we're not perfect. I mean, he expects us to try to do something about it, but he knows that it isn't anything that is going to be fixed. So he has forgiven us. And this is the attitude that he would like us to take with those in our lives who have hurt us. Amen. Please join me now in the assurance of our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Each of us is finally accountable to God. So let us pray <coughs> saying, Lord, we are in need of your mercy. Have patience with us. Lord, we acknowledge that we all sin against our brothers and sisters in Christ. Forgive us even as we forgive each other. Help us to be merciful to each other in the church. We pray for Justice, Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Gretchen, our bishop, and Beth and Joan, our priests. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for West Central Mission, Spokane. Lord, we are in need of your mercy. Have patience with us. Lord, we acknowledge that we desire to repay violence with violence. Open our hearts to forgive even those who commit evil acts toward us and those we love. Help us to love mercifully in your world. We pray for Donald, our president, and our national and local governments. Lord, we are in need of your mercy. Have patience with us. 
Lord, we acknowledge we do not always appreciate the diversity of your creation. Teach us to live in peace with each other and with your creation. Help us to love mercifully with our world. Lord, we are in need of your mercy. Have patience with us. Lord, we acknowledge that we do not love our neighbors as you love us. Forgive us for placing ourselves in judge as judge over others when judgment belongs to you alone. Help us to accept the great mercy you choose to show others. We join the Daughters of the King as we pray for Chuck and Marty Skippers, John and Sarah Seitz, Tom, Linda, and Alice Selstad, Leslie Shaw, and Sharon and Ken Smith. Lord, we are in need of your mercy. Have patience with us. Lord, we pray for those whose lives are broken by evil. Because of your mercy, we believe that whatever befalls them, they belong to you. You care for the broken hearted. Help us to share your love with all those who are hurting. For those on our prayer list, we pray for Chris, Leo, Brandon, Emily, Rika, Robin, Helen, Heather, Pat, Carol, Annie, Doug, Barry, Carolyn, Brenda, Joan, Judy, Shirley, Mary Lynn, Jeff, Jan, Derek, Ruth, Bob, Marty, Nathan, Bob, Brian, Tim, Kathy, Duane, Jeff, Dale, Ed, and Barbara. Give them courage and hope in their distress and the strength to endure. We pray for social justice and the end to racism in our country. We pray for the protection of our police and all first responders. We pray for the protection of those who protest police brutality. We pray for those who are suffering from the coronavirus. We pray for those affected by the fires. Please now add your own petitions at this time. Lord, we are in need of your mercy. Have patience with us. Lord, we remember those who died in violence. We, we remember those men and women of the armed services, innocent bystanders, first responders, and even those we have called enemies. The dead belong to you, O oh Lord. Even as we seek your mercy for ourselves, judge all those who have died with mercy. We pray for all those who have lost their lives to the coronavirus. Lord, we are in need of your mercy. Have patience with us. Hasten, O oh Father, the coming of thy kingdom, and grant that we thy servants who now live by faith, may with joy behold thy son at his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Well, it is time for birthdays, travels, and anniversaries. So I know Sue uh, uh, Gunderson has had a birthday this past week. Are there others? Other birthday folks? This is Annie. My birthday is on Tuesday. Okay. All right. So Annie and Sue, any others? Okay. Let us pray the birthday prayer for the birthday girls. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on Sue and Annie on as they begin another year grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust 
in your goodness all the days of their lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, any travel folks? Anybody traveling this week? Oh, yes, uh, I'm traveling. Sandy, where are you going? Sandy, Dwayne and I are going to Seattle. I have a doctor's appointment. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Barbara McKenzie, I'm traveling to Mount Vernon uh, to be with my brothers as we start deciding how to handle the estate for my mom. Okay, Barbara. Glad to have you with us this morning. And uh, so we need to pray for Sandy and Barbara. Anybody else traveling? All right. Let us actually. Yeah. We're going beyond Seattle to Orcas Island also. So. Okay. Oh, such a beautiful, beautiful place. All right, let's pray for our travelers. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go. We find wherever we go. Surround them with your loving care. Protect them from every danger and bring them in safety to their journey, to their journey's end, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Do we have any anniversaries? No anniversaries. Anybody in need of special prayers today? All right, I would like us to say um, special prayers of Thanksgiving for Marty, who is better. She um, has made some vast improvements. And um, so I uh, will talk about that when coffee hour starts. But I think we need to pray a prayer of Thanksgiving for Marty and also for John Poston, who is also much better. So um, join me in prayer for them, please. Gracious God, you have come to your servants and begun healing. We thank you so much, Lord, for that gift. We pray for all who are a part of St. Timothy's in need of healing and ask for your healing touch for each and every one. We are so grateful when you act. Amen. Becky, you had your hand up. Was that for either Marty or John? Um, no, I, I just found out that an old friend of mine from Camp Cross lost his home, in fact, his whole neighborhood in the fires um, in Oregon. His name is Mark Mousseau. Um, his whole uh, neighborhood is, is gone, all of their homes. So if we could pray for the um, victims of the fires. Yes, let's do that. Um, uh, and for those who have lost their lives as well. I don't know, um, I, I know Dale Carr, who's a priest, an Oregon priest, and he was the one who visited Laurie in the hospital um, and anointed, gave her the last rites. Um, his whole family lived in Phoenix, so they, they have lost everything. So it is truly terrible. Uh, we are complaining about the smoke, but we know nothing compared to what kind of a, a wild hell that is in Oregon and California and Washington as well. So let's pray for those victims. Gracious God, we know you are with us in the storm and we pray that you will be with everyone who's involved in the fire storm. The fires are terrible, Lord, and we ask that you be present and help those who are fleeing, evacuating, be with those who cannot get out. We pray for the souls of all who have perished in the fire. We know that they are with you. We ask that you bring an end to these terrible fires as quickly as is possible and ask that you watch over all of us. Help all of those who have breathing difficulties as they struggle with the smoke that has blanketed the whole West Coast uh, and three states in particular, Lord. So watch over us in this time of trial. 
Amen. Any, any other prayer needed before we move on to our colleagues? All right. Oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of your glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessings through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O oh God, the King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning, drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may, when night comes, rejoice to give you thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. Let us say together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But also, above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And let us also say together the prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. We will soon have our blessing, our concluding um, versicle and our blessing, but I would ask you to stay on the line for a few minutes for just um, an announcement about beginning church uh, in person, face-to-face -face church. So let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
Okay, announcement time. We are going to try to have face-to-face -face church next Sunday. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, there are some things you need to know. First of all, uh, I haven't had a chance to talk to Justin yet, but I'm hoping Justin and Richard can be there. Is that right? If, if we, all right. So they will be our vergers, and they are given control of the whole shebang. Sort of. I mean, they don't control me, but, you know, uh, but they control everybody else. So I want that to be stated loud and clear. Uh, they will be responsible for traffic flow and everything else that happens. Um, the second really important thing to know, first of all, if we have smoke like this next Sunday, I am going to postpone church because it is just not healthy for most of our population to be out. And, and breathing the air outside. So know that and be uh, prepared. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen, but anyway, we hope that we will be able to have church on Sunday. So here's the other thing. Joan, I'm, I'm sure Joan is gonna be there right up on the altar with me, I hope. Um, Joan Dahl and um, forgive me, Joan, for not giving you a, a part in our morning prayer. You were gone and then I forgot to, Put you back in again but anyway so when you only about 27 to 28 29 folks are going to be allowed in the service and you must make a reservation through the office or you can email me um, if you plan to attend and want to attend um, this is so we don't have a massive crowd that we have to turn away. Not that church ever has what we would call massive crowds, but just the same, we wanna be able to have control over who comes and, uh, and where they sit. Um, there will be X's on the pews um, to mark where people can sit so that they are six feet away from each other. We are going to attempt a Eucharist. Um, it will be different. Um, and it will be weird, but it will be better than, uh, than nothing. And we will be glad once again to take the Lord's Supper. Uh, at least I will be and, and be glad to say that wonderful prayer, Eucharistic prayer, one of our prayers. And so um, that's going to happen. You're going to have to be very careful when you come forward one at a time to take communion. You just tip your mask up a a little tiny bit, take communion and put your cups in the, the um, trash uh, receptacle, not trash, no, it wouldn't be trash because it's gonna hold Jesus. Uh, it would be a receptacle fit for a king. So that'll be next to the, the table where we're gonna take communion. Um, and um, you'll be expected to behave yourselves. Families that come together, and I hope maybe we might have the Malonies. I'm not sure about the Deets or uh, the Harpers, but if we do have families, they can sit together. Couples can sit together. Um, but we are just going to have to be very careful. And if you are ill or at high risk, please do not come. I mean, very high risk. All of us are at high risk, but please do not come to the service. So at that, I'm gonna hush and no more, no more talk from me and we will have um, coffee hour. Except to say that I have a new dog. You can unmute if you want to. I haven't seen him yet um, and he doesn't really have a name. I kind of think, um, 